First of all, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming here today. It's a, it's a pleasure to be speaking to you today. Uh, my name is Victor. I'm a software engineer at Nubank, and where I work mostly with backend services dealing with financial logic. Today, we're going to talk about real-time financials uh, with microservices and functional programming. So first of all, for those of you who don't know um, what Nubank does, uh, we're a financial services, Brazilian financial services company. Um, we're essentially building a digital bank from scratch in Brazil. And today, our main product is a credit card that's 100% controlled by a mobile app. And we've had over 9 million people request this credit card since our, our launch in uh, late 2014. Uh, and even though we're in a financial services company, we really think of ourselves as a tech company. Uh, it's part of our DNA. It's our, essentially our core competence is, is, is technology, software engineering. And the big question uh, in the early days was, how can we leverage uh, software engineering to gain a competitive edge all over these well-established, big, experienced uh, banks that were already in this market? And one thing that we figured was uh, the best way for us to accomplish this was to keep on moving forward, to be able to adapt quickly, to be able to all, not, never be afraid of adding new functionalities, adding new code to prod. So from the early days, uh, we really built our systems around continuous delivery. We thought that that was one of the key components of what would make us a, a strong company and be able to compete in the market. So naturally, with uh, continuous delivery, we came to the conclusion that we should build from scratch, from the very beginning, uh, uh, in a microservices architecture. Because, you know, as we, you know, we've talked over uh, today in the microservices um, uh, talks, we know that we can deploy new uh, services fairly easy. There, you know, you can have a continuous integration system that de deploy new f features, new services without really con being concerned about breaking. Uh, the rest of my system. Uh, if you if you do it right, you, you should get some decoupling, so you're never really afraid of replacing uh, a, a new service, killing something off. You're never really too afraid of, of making these changes. And you also get this whole bounded by context concept that allows for separate teams to be developing separate features at the same time uh, and be able to get that to prod without really uh, depending on anyone else. So this is, these are really features, key features for us to be able to compete, uh, adapt, and scale our business to the point that we really wanted. So since the beginning, this is how we built our architecture. And it turned out that the key question that, that arose was, what happens when we need to combine data from across all these separate services? And especially, what happens if you need to do that to do that in real time. So this is the problem that I want to talk about today. So before we do that, let's take a quick step back so you guys have a little more context of what a service at Nubank looks like, especially a service uh, that deals with financial logic. So the first thing is that it's written in Clojure, which is a functional programming language built on the JVM. We're going to have producers and consumers through Kafka. Uh, and Kafka is essentially the way that we do most of our asynchronous, event-driven integrations between services. Uh, most writes actually come through Kafka. Uh, we get persistence with Datomic, which is, the date, which is the database we use for each of these services. And I'll get, uh, I'll explain a little more uh, how Datomic works in the next slide. And we have REST APIs uh, that are mostly used for other services to access data and for actually the mobile clients to also access the data and business logic from each of these services. And all of these, uh, you know, ev every service, you know, everything is running on AWS, on two AZs, with config as code, code, immutable infra, horizontally scalable, sharded by customers. Each of these topics could really merit a talk on their own, so I won't really uh, dive deep into that. So out of all the technologies that we use, I guess Datomic is the one that's the least uh, familiar to, to most people. So I'll just briefly explain uh, how it works. So you can think of Datomic as an immutable append-only database, which means that I'm never going to update a value in my database. I'm never going to overwrite anything. I'm only going to be asserting new facts. Uh, so you can one simple way to think about it is that essentially it's a database that works like Git. In Git, I'm never going to actually erase a line. I'm only going to say, 
do not consider this line as of this commit. From now, now on, consider this new line. So the idea is that you, I can always, uh, you know, I will not, never change my data. I can always look back and have snapshots at what the data looked like, looked like at each point in time. So you have this very strong from, you know, from, uh, you have a, this really strong audit trail by default, which is very powerful uh, in uh, financial services in general, if you need to be a system of record uh, in any way. And the Atomic uh, is also asset on rights, so Atomic, consistent, isolated, and durable. So it's a really a database that, that's focused on uh, this immutable data model as well as very high consistency. Uh, so if you are in, more interested in to you know, learn more about the Atomic, I highly recommend a talk for, from other new bank engineers that's exploring four hidden superpowers of the Atomic. It's available online. Uh, you should check it out. So going back to our problem, um, today we have about 90 uh, services at Nubank. Every couple of weeks we have new services, we kill off new, new other services. Um, and the key problem was that in a credit card business, a lot of the business logic and a lot of the hard questions that we need to answer depend on data from across all these separate services. So let's just think about some questions that a, a credit card business needs to answer. Uh, should I authorize a purchase? Should I block a card? Should I charge interest? How, what's the late balance? What does a customer owe me? And these clearly depend on the purchases the customer's made, the payments, you know, any chargebacks that he's had, interest, currencies, just to name a few. And each of these entities reside on separate services and their own databases. So I need to pull data from all these places together to be able to answer these questions. And, you know, to make matters worse, we actually show these hard to calculate numbers in real time to our customers. Uh, that's actually a, a big part of our value proposition is the idea that we can show in real time what your finances with new bank looks like. And, uh, you know, new bank means, new in Portuguese means naked or transparent. So it's really idea that we want to be transparent and show the data, to the customer these aggregates as best as possible. And naturally, because these numbers are, were spread out on separate databases, separate services, and they're very hard to get to, um, the first thing that happened was that we, we ended up not having one canonical definition of what these numbers look like. And naturally, what ends up happening is that you create ad hoc definitions of what these numbers actually are, either by analysts doing analysis or their models, or even engineers in different services trying to replicate the same uh, data in different ways with slightly different definitions. And this is very, very dangerous uh, because you end up with this analysis versus uh, uh, operational uh, definition gap. So if you, can, you can imagine that uh, if I have an analyst that's gonna be evaluating the, 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 how correct a collections strategy, how well a collection strategy is working, how can he determine th that it's going well or not if he can't guarantee that the definition uh, of his definition of what uh, the customer owes us is the same definition that the collections service is going to be looking at? Um, and because these were the most important numbers that we had, and these were the numbers that you know all our stakeholders cared about, our investors, our customers, our analysts, and especially our regulators, the central bank, we needed to do something better for them. Um, and the first thing we thought about was, well, how do, how do we, now we need to find a way to create this canonical definition for these numbers. And what's the best way to represent this data? And the first thing we thought about was uh, the canonical way of representing financial information is essentially a balance sheet or accounting in general. And there are some benefits to that. And the first one, and I think the most important one, is that you can now, using accounting, you can apply this generally accepted accounting principles. So no longer are these balances a matter of a, an analyst's opinion or the CFO's opinion or a software engineer's opinion of what that number should look like. Now I can apply these principles and I have this verifiable, unbiased version of what the number should look like. You get conservation of money by default. So every credit should have a debit. So I'm never gonna be just creating money out of thin air. I'm not gonna just be destroying value out of nowhere. I always have the traceability of how the money is moving around. And lastly, uh, which was really nice for our 
uh, architecture at the time was that accounting is essentially one of the original event source systems. You only really care about a log of credits and debits and the balance, which is the number you're going to be looking at, just a calculated value on top of that. And this event source property really fit really well with the way we, uh, with our event driven uh, through Kafka integrations between services. Um, so let's briefly look at what this accounting model looks like. We have a book account. A book account is nothing more than an entity that's going to be aggregating credits and debits. Uh, and the book account is going to have a type. And these types are essentially the names that we give to the balances, the numbers, the, these metrics that we're looking at. So a cash balance, a prepaid balance, a late balance, a current limit, uh, receivables, payables, and so on. You're going to have an entry. An entry is nothing more than just one representation of uh, an amount, a credit account, a debit account, and a post date. And the post date, we say that it's the business relevant date. So it's not when I uh, found out about a payment, it's not when I transacted that payment to the database, it's when the payment was actually made by the customer. Uh, so it's this business timeline concept of date. And then you get the balance. The balance is just the cumulative sum of all the entries for a book account. And these three entities are essentially the, the, you know, the core of accounting revolve around these three entities. But at Nubank, we, we thought that we could add a few more to add uh, essentially metadata for analysis and traceability to how we, you know, we're going to deal with, with this model. So we also included a movement, the concept of a movement. So if you think of an event, a payment arriving or a purchase arriving, it, you're actually not going to just create one credit and one debit in two accounts. You're actually going to be moving money around for sev several different accounts at the same time. And a movement is just a way for you to, to group together the same events that happen because of the same um, Kafka event. So it's just a grouping of uh, a collection of entries and carrying the metadata related to the original event. So you can think of a movement as a, a mapping one-to-one, -one, one Kafka event to one database transaction with a lot of metadata related to both of these actions. And lastly, we have this concept of a meta entity. The meta entity is just a reference for, a, a, for the original, event, uh, original entity that lives in some other database that, that originated uh, this, this movement. So it's just a way for us to have the audit trail to trace back all these entries, where do they come from? What, what's, you know, everything that's related to it in the original service, what do they look like? So this is essentially the model that we want to create. Uh, and I, I recommend to anyone that's going to be building anything with accounting to read uh, algebraic models for accounting system, systems because it gives you a very rigorous view of uh, accounting. It's very helpful when you're building uh, a software uh, around that. So, you know, our conclusion was we're going to create this double entry accounting service. We know our model. We, you know, make sense. What, what will actually the data flow, how would that look like? Uh, so the, the goals that we had was that the first thing is that it should be event driven via Kafka. Uh, because the great thing about this is that we can just plug into the already existing topics that we had. We wouldn't need to change anything on the other services. And I can just use those topics to create my new state and start collecting data for my new balances that I wanted to use in my operations and analysis and so on. I needed high availability. So these numbers, for them to be used both in operations, both uh, in, in analysis, so show it to my customers, show it to other services, and use it for my models, I needed this to be highly available. Otherwise, I would never get this to you know my customers. Only an analysis could be looking at this number. And I would still have this analytical operational gap. Uh, and since it needs to be highly available, naturally, you're going to lose some consistency. Um, and we accepted that trade-off. It's like we're consciously going to uh, give away some consistency here uh, for this availability. But we need to make sure that we have traceability. Uh, we we only, can only be inconsistent if we have enough information to understand why, when, and how we were inconsistent. Uh, and the idea that we also needed to have a very strong audit trail for this. Because if I can measure my inconsistencies, I can take action to fix what I calculated because of stale data or incorrect data. Or at least, at the very least, I can uh, evaluate 
the costs of, of these inconsistencies? What decisions did I actually make uh, wrong because of these inconsistencies? And it needed to be resilient to distributed system craziness. So a system going down, uh, ordering, concurrency, uh, bugs in other services. And so we need to have some sort of resilience built into it. So the actual flow, and we call it the ideal flow, because it's the one that we thought how the world would look like, and it's like, oh, this is what perfectly the system would look like. Um, the, we already had these services publishing messages to Kafka in separate topics, new purchase, new, uh, new payment, so on. We'd grab these events, and we, you know, uh, in our new service, we'd just apply a function of the payload of the event and transform that to this new model. And the key thing is that if you, if I can transform my original event to this entries movement model accounting model, just with the with the payload of that event, then I have a great set of properties. And it, well, if everything's okay, I'm going to transact that to the database. But the biggest thing is that if I'm just looking at the event, I, I no longer care about uh, mutable state. So I'm not accessing the database. I'm not doing gets on other services. I, I, I only care about the event payload. And because of that, event ordering doesn't matter. So if an event uh, happens before the other and I didn't expect that, it doesn't matter. Also, it's thread safe. If I have concurrency, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm, it's not going to be a problem. I can just have many, many threads running at the same time because it's not modifying the same uh, state that it's reading because, well, it's not reading any state. Uh, and so in the end, with this, all you really needed to worry about to get consistency is that you needed to guarantee that all events are consumed. And naturally, you want, it, want them to be consumed at a, fast enough, quickly enough, so that the, the, the time between the, the event happening and us knowing about this you know, is kept to a minimum. So let's look at it, an actual example of, uh, of this flow. So let's say we have a customer with a current limit of 1,000 reais. He makes a purchase of 100 reais. Uh, reais, by the way, is a Brazilian currency. Uh, and you have an, uh, so the amount of the purchase is 100 reais. Interchange is one real. And one, uh, interchange is essentially one of the ways that we make money. We get, for every transaction, we get a percentage of that, uh, of that uh, purchase. And this is how you know, most of credit cards in the world work. We charge that, that amount to the merchant. This arrives at our, our, at our service, the Boentry service. And then we're applying just a function of the purchase. We're going to first recognize a receivable and a payable of 100 reais. And then we're going to reduce the limit of 100 reais. We're going to recognize our revenue. And then all of these, you know, the, list, the list of uh, the entries are going to uh, it's a movement, and all of that is going to be transacted at once in the database. So you're never going to have just one of the entries existing uh, at any point in time. So it's one atomic transaction. And the final balances end up with, uh, you have a current limit of 900, uh, receivables of 100, pay payable of 99, and some revenue of, of one hell. Um, and well, great. We finally arrived at the balances that we wanted. So uh, see, if I just listen to all the events that I care about, they all have these properties that, uh, that I considered. So it's, I, can only, I can always translate uh, the events to these movements just as a function of that event. I'll eventually get to uh, the balances that I need and can just uh, get my information from this service from now on. And I'm sure you're thinking, well, yeah, that's great and all, but there are so many ways this can go wrong in a distributed system. And this, that's very much true. Uh, we can't guarantee consistencies. Uh, and there are so many ways that this can go wrong, and I'll name a few. Uh, but the key, key thing is that we can measure it, and we, we model out to measure these inconsistencies. So the first thing that can happen is, well, a service, any other services uh, uh, publishing to Kafka might have some downtime, might go down for any type of reason. Uh, and obviously, we need the tooling and the monitoring around, you know, figuring out when a service is up or not, uh, any having the tooling around, you know, making sure that it goes back up as soon as possible. This, this is just the tooling that you're going to need for any microservice architecture. Um, but in addition to that, what we have is we have the concept of the post-date versus produced at timestamps. So I know when something happened in the real world, and I know when it actually left my original service. So knowing that, if I have, for example, post-date that was uh, yesterday, but the produced at it was just today, I know that for some reason that purchase uh, took one day 
to be processed by my purchase system and publish. So I know that there's a gap between my post date and my produce date that uh, created some level of inconsistency in, because of the service downtime. We can have Kafka lag. So uh, also, just like with service downtime, you need to monitor this. You need to have the tooling around knowing when you would not be able to consume all the, all the messages that are produced. Uh, and you need to have the tooling around, you know, increasing partitions, spinning new instances to add parallelism for you to consume those messages. But you're eventually going to have some lag. Um, and you can measure that just by consuming the, just by comparing the produced stat versus consumed at timestamps of, of this flow. And each of these dates are actually stored within that movement entity. These are the metadata, part of the metadata that we store there. And then lastly, you have processing time. It's not enough for the, our service to learn about the, 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 this event. It also needs to transact to the, transact to the database. Uh, and because any request that happens between you know, me finding that out and, and actually transacting the data, database is going to have some stale data. And I can evaluate this just by comparing the consumed at with the, the transaction time, DB uh, transaction instant, that you get by default with the atomic. The atomic has a timestamp for each fact that's asserted to the database. So now, well, we got our numbers. We've found, found a way to at least know when we're inconsistent, and we can take action on top of that. So I can, if I find out that I, I'm, if I consume a message that there's a very big gap between produced at or consumed at, I can let the world know. I can, you know, for a specific customer that had stale data for a while, I can react to that. Or at the very least, I can feed the, the, this data into my models and understand uh, the reasons why I'm getting consistent data and the costs of, of these decisions. And this flow would be very nice, uh, but the key problem uh, is that this approach of only having a pure function of the event payload to create this model won't always work. And as, a, and as soon as you start having to look at state to create these entries, then you have you know, a whole nother level of complexity. So let me just give you a very quick example of this stateful flow that we call. So a flow that requires us to look at mutable states. Let's look at that same customer that made a 100 highs purchase. Uh, some time has passed, and now he's late. He didn't pay his bill on time. So that 100 has became 100 has late balance. Now he thankfully makes a payment of 150 has. We, we try to create the entries for that. The first thing we do is we need to amortize that debt. We need to reduce that late balance. And immediately we see that, well, I can't just reduce my late balance by 150. I can't be negative late. I can't have someone owing me a negative amount. It's actually me owing them that amount. So naturally, because of the accounting principles that we have, that's not the book account that, that, that should be, you know, have that balance. It's something else. It has different properties. Uh, so we can't, we need to look at the state for that. Then we increase back the limit to 100 reais. And then we finally assign those 50 reais to the prepaid balance, which, where it should, which is where it should reside. And the final balance, is that the current limit is back to 1,000, we have cash of 150, and now the prepaid balance of 50 and everything else uh, didn't change. So if you look at the prepaid balance, the final prepaid balance is a direct function of the initial late balance. Um, so yeah, so now these are the adapters that, I'm, that is gonna go convert the events to my model. They're not just a function of the, the payload. They're also a function of the current balances. And because of that, the first thing I need to do is I need to make sure that these balances don't change during the calculation, right? I need to apply some sort of lock. I can do that you know, in the database. I can do that via uh, Kafka partition keys, partitioned by customer ID. There are several ways that you can uh, approach this. The key thing is that these balances can change uh, while you're calculating your entries. And then because of the properties of accounting and these balances, any movement in the past will affect the balances from every day from that point forward. So it's, it's not enough for me to make sure that I didn't break anything on the date of that movement, the business post date of that movement. I need to check if I didn't break anything from that point forward. So it makes things a lot more complex. And 
one thing that I, we needed to make sure is that we can't uh, allow for our data to be corrupted because of ordering of events. Essentially, we need to make, be able to guarantee all the properties that the pure uh, function of the payload flow, the ideal flow had, we need to guarantee those same properties when we look at state. So the first, for the first two uh, problems, I mean, they're annoying, but there are ways to work around them. For the second two, I think it's more interesting to talk about, we started using uh, invariants. So what are invariants? Invariants are essentially properties that should hold true at all times. And when we talk about accounting, essentially these properties have to do with the balances on each book account. So some balance, balances can't coexist. I can't be both late and prepaid. Someone can't owe me money while I, I at the same time, owe them money. Some balances can't be negative, so I can't have a negative cash balance. It makes, does it make sense? Also, some balances can't be positive, so I can't have a revenue of credit loss. And because we're using generally accepted accounting principles, uh, these aren't a matter of opinion either. I can just uh, look up what a balance and what the properties of what a book account should look like and just mimic that and establish those properties uh, explicitly. So let's look at this stateful flow, what it looks like and how, how did, did we manage uh, the stateful flow to be very, very similar to the original flow, the same properties as the ideal flow. So let's get that initial balance of 100 reais. Let's not worry about the, the current limits that, uh, for this example, so just to keep things simple. We still have the, the Kafka topics, still have the, the event. But now, the way I'm going to convert that is not just a function of the payload. It's also a function of the database. And when I say it's a function of the database, uh, at Nubank, we explicitly pass the database as arguments to every function call that is going to access it. And we essentially pass in this time-stamped, immutable uh, uh, version of the database. And with Atomic, it's really cool because if I know my function call, if I know the arguments, and my database is immutable, and I know when I call that function, I get this very nice time series debugging property that I can always recreate that state and understand why something bro broke. So before we actually pass on our database as an argument to that function, I'm going to first check if the database is in a valid state. Because if it's already in an invalid state, it should stop right there. Data is corrupted, need a, a migration, I need to fix this somehow. But if it's OK, I pass that on. Then I'm going to create my movement and with one entry. And the entry here I'm going to create is going to be uh, removing, taking money 150 highs from late and putting it to cash. And then I check and I essentially with, with the Atomic, one, one of the cool things we can also do is we can have this in memory uh, fake version of the database that pretends to transact things. So I can just uh, do a pass on this database with pretend that, that I actually transacted this movement. What does this database look like? And I can fetch that new database, this in-memory uh, you know, uh, exploratory database, and use that, put that in as an argument to my functions, and check, is this database valid now? And we know that it's not. There are invariant violations. And the violation here is that I'm going to have a negative balance. I'm taking 150 highs from uh, this late balance. So I'm going to get a negative balance where I shouldn't. I get these violations and I apply them to a function that's going to try to fix it. And the way we fix it is essentially by adding more entries to that movement. And the way, so we add this new entry of moving money from increasing prepaid and increasing late. And we call these new entries corrections. And then we use this movement and again, plug that into the, the check, plug that into this like fake database in memory uh, exploratory database. And we check again, are there any other violations? If there are other violations, I'll keep that loop for, I don't know, 20 tries. And if I can't fix it, I'll throw an exception. But if I can fix it, I'm going to transact that to the database. And then I end up, you know, after the correction, I end up with the final correct state. So by doing all of this, it's a way that I can guarantee the same properties, the same original properties that that ideal flow of the pure function uh, uh, had. Obviously, there were some 
a lot of challenges getting this to prod and actually using this. So the first one, the most important one, is that uh, this fixing invariant logic is extremely complex. Um, so figuring out all the invariants that we needed to define, and especially define ways of fixing these violations in ways that it wouldn't introduce new violations was very hard. So it took a long time for us to, to figure this out. We quickly realized that bugs in other services would generate incorrect entries or could, you know, could affect our database and we need to find ways to, to monitor that and the tooling around fixing any problems that we had. Datomic is great. We love Datomic. We love the way it deals uh, with this audit trail. We love how we use it to explore data, to pretend that we had transactions and check the database is valid. We love everything about it. It saved us over and over again. But Datomic's indexing is really only tested until 10 billion facts. And after that uh, amount of data, you're going to get, you know, indexing slows down. You're going to get some back pressure. Your transaction time, you know, transacting, uh, uh, a database transaction is going to take more time. You're going to build lag and not going to have the throughput needed to really uh, continue using the database. So we need to keep it small. And Atomic isn't the best option for analytical workload. So this model, this transactional model, immutable uh, model, is not the best for analytical work workload, especially when you're dealing with aggregates. But we, you know, thankfully, we found ways around each of these challenges. So the first one, to, fix, to figure out this, this complexity of um, all these invariant violations and how to fix them, we started using generative testing. For those of you who don't know, generative testing is instead of, you might know as property-based testing as well, is instead of me explicitly saying uh, what the input to a function, what the expected out output of that function would look like, I'll just write a function that describes a property that should always hold true. And as you can imagine, these prob properties that should always hold true are the same properties that we want to guarantee in prod. So there's a very nice way for mapping the, uh, the way you actually create these generative tests. And since you don't care about, uh, is, since this property should hold true at all, at all times, you don't really care about the input. So you can actually just, generate random input, apply that, and just make sure that after you just throw a bunch of randomly generated input, the property is still true. So we have these random, uh, we have these generators that generate uh, from our schemas, these events with random numbers, random orderings, and so on, random dates. And the one thing that we, we took away from this process is that we should embed the least amount of domain logic assumptions into the generative test. Because with a distributed system, all your assumptions of what your business look, looks like just go out the door. One example that we always used to say, and we were very wrong when we said it, was you're never going to have a purchase cancellation before you actually have the purchase. Well, if you have a distributed system and your pur purchase cancellation service is a separate service from your, your purchase recognition service, you might actually find out about the cancellation before you find out about the purchase. Um, and if you embed that assumption into your testing, you're not going to be exploring all the chaos that can arise at, with all these things that can happen in ways that you'd never expected. Um, so yeah, we found this the, the hard way. So this is enclosure. This is what uh, the generative testing uh, looks like. Uh, yeah, a lot of parentheses, enclosure is, is like that. Uh, but you can just see that essentially for all inputs, and in this case, the inputs are one account, so the customer account, and a list of events. And these events are just randomly generated, in this case, just purchases and payments. So a list of purchases and payments. Uh, I'm going to make sure that the function, and the function is, I'm going to get my database, Datomic. I'm going to save all, consume all these, uh, the, these events and the accounts, save them to the database, get what the database looked like after I transact those entities, and then check uh, if the property that I care about, so the invariant I'm looking at, is still true. In this case, the properties, the balances are positive. So you can run, you know, a quick check of uh, 500 uh, trials. So I can, you know, even add more than that, and make sure that that variant never broke with all that randomly gener generated input. And if it didn't break, great, result is true. But if it did break, 
uh, it's going to return to me a minimal case uh, that when that property broke. And I can look at it and understand how my fixing violations uh, logic went wrong and iterate on that to, to make sure that that property will always hold true. So uh, for monitoring and you know, figuring out how other services will interact with, with this double entry service, we needed to create this monitoring and replay history tooling. So the first thing that we needed to, to we cared about is that we needed to make sure that uh, we had, didn't have any events that were missing. And this is you know, essentially a batch job that or a big query that will make sure that every event before a certain point in time uh, in all the other databases were recognized in my double entry service. Um, so yeah, we just run essentially a query for that. If all the events are there, great. If they're not, I need to find a way to republish these events. So essentially all the services have endpoints to replay all the messages that it did produce or it should have produced. The nice thing about this is that with the Atomic, I can actually reproduce that message with the exact payload and metadata as it went out the first time. Because it can always traverse back in time and look at what that entity looked like at that point in time and just recreate that event with the same metadata and payload. So I'm never actually losing uh, information. And then we, you know, the other problem that we had is that if the database is actually ever corrupted, I need to find a way to erase it and start over. And the nice thing about this is that we have this endpoint that retract all entries. So we essentially reset the business timeline, uh, but we don't reset the database timeline, which means that if I have a corrupted database and I want to you know, make sure that it stop that, I'll retract all the entries from this point back republish all the events, recreate the new, new, new database. But the fact that at one point in time, this database had corrupt, incorrect entries is not lost on me. I can always traverse back in history and look at that database before that retraction and see those entries are still there. So the nice thing about this is that I don't, no longer need to choose between having, having an audit trail and having data that's easy to work with, easy to, to get your head around. With the problem with the atomic, we needed to keep it small. So we started sharding by uh, customer, um, and we need to make sure that we could shard the database by customer. And the easy thing about this is we just need to make sure that we you know, had no entries that was were moving money around book accounts owned by different customers, uh, because it would be just very hard to shard if we did if we did that. So any peer-to-peer -peer interaction uh, is just going to be two event events instead, instead of just one moving money between the two. So we did that from the beginning. Very easy to shard by customer. You can shard. You could even have one database per customer if you wanted. But even if we had this one database per customer, as time goes by, it's still the database is going to grow to infinity because, well, he's always adding more data to that, hopefully transacting a lot of money and paying it uh, back to us. So we also need to shard by time. And with accounting, we have a very nice way of representing the previous database and the end state of the previous database. It's just the final balances for every book account. Uh, so the final balances for the previous time shard is the initial balances for your time shard from there on out. And because it's, uh, it's easy and necessary, we were sharding our database by time fairly often. So every couple of months, we're always uh, sharding it uh, to keep it small, keep a very, uh, very small working set for uh, uh, performance purposes. For an analytical workload, uh, we actually had, uh, we came up with an ETL solution. Um, so we essentially, we get the immutable uh, data, uh, immutable logs from the, from the Atomic. We extract those logs, uh, save them on S3, pivot them to tables, because tables are easier and better for analytical workload. With Spark, save those tables on S3. Then we apply functions and generate the balances. And not just that, we can actually retrieve uh, metadata from all the other services because we have them stored uh, in the service. So retrieve that metadata, create new tables for us to map out all the entries, how they relate to, to the original services metadata. Also with Spark, and then we load them up to Redshift and let Redshift do its magic. We also uh, make it accessible through MetaBase, which is a BI tool uh, for easier access uh, for the data. So the result is that we have this real-time balance sheet um, per customer uh, with a lot of metadata that you can essentially you know, have a 
very clear view of how each customer or each group of customers uh, is affecting your business. Uh, if you look up there, you're going to see uh, balance sheets per user. In the middle, you're going to see aggregates per due day, and download by creation month. So when we uh, started, uh, we opened the account for the customer and understand how each of these groups interact in a different way. And when we end up with two timelines. We have the first timeline is the actual database timeline. So what did we know at which point in time? And if you look at a specific point in time, we also have the business timeline, which is the you know, business relevant official version of what, what the world looked like in our opinion at that point in time. Uh, and it's, this also feeds into our modeling uh, because it doesn't really matter what we know or what we eventually found out. Knowing the gap between you know, what we think now and what we thought when we actually make the decision, this is very important, very important and key to map out in, your, in our machine learning models. So this really adds a whole layer of power and audit trail uh, capacities to this uh, service. So what we like about this is that, well, we finally were capable of creating these canonical definitions of our most important numbers. Um, we now have financial analysis applied at the customer level and in real time. We have these, this inconsistency traceability, so we can take action on the inconsistencies if we want to, or at the very least, we can price how that's affecting our business. These invariants that we created provide a whole uh, set of uh, safety nets for our business, make sure that everything's consistent, everything makes sense and correct and valid. Generative tests finds real bugs in ways that no other tool uh, that I know of can find, which is, so it's super powerful and I highly recommend anyone working with distributed systems to uh, start doing some kind of generative tests and you fall in love with it, uh, I'm sure. When we have this ability to replay history without losing data, so we don't need to choose between audit trails and data that you can get your head around. So that's very, very nice. Shardable by customer and by time, so it's scalable. And it's also extensible to other financial products. Uh, and the good thing about this is that not all financial products actually require the stateful flow. You can get away with uh, the, the pure function of the event flow, uh, which make thing, makes things a lot easier. And this is all I have for you guys today. Thank you very much. And any questions? Sorry? In, in which way? So yeah, so the ETL part of uh, our, our system, that I'm probably not the best person to talk about. It's our data infra uh, team that works uh, that deals with that. Um, so maybe I can I can give you the information for for, for that, and we, we can talk to them. So yes, um, I'm sure you can do this with other databases. Well, we we like Datomic. We like Immutability in general, I, we think it's uh, uh, very easy to get your head around. Um, it, it's a lot easier to handle uh, the complexities of domains and how uh, things can interact. Have, it, it also adds this embedded audit trail by default, so you don't need to worry about you know, making mistakes. We think it's very hard for you to have this replay history property uh, have this uh, without some sort of uh, immutable database. But I'm sure there are ways you can still get that with other databases as well. We just we just like the atomic did that from you know by default. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Yeah. So we, yeah, we're, we're going for the asset transaction in that situation. We don't want the database to uh, ever be in a state that it creates an invalid. Somehow, it was. I don't actually ever want the database to be in. in 
breaking any violations at any point in time. So if I just prevent the transaction to happen before and make sure that I fix before actually transacting, I guarantee that always my database will not be breaking those, those, those violations. Yeah, right. So if I, I ever only persist uh, valid events. Uh, then you have an exception, uh, and it's going to be a dead letter that on Kafka, and we need to manually understand why uh, there was a, you know, inconsistency there, and why we're creating this invalid state. And usually, I mean, after you come, we get to uh, stable in prod, and we figure out, you know, with generative tests, all the violations that we can have and how to fix them. You know, we, we're not breaking anything else. We shouldn't have that. Uh, but until then. Essentially, you get manual input for us to analyze and create new rules so that I can just replay that same message and then finally convert to a valid state. Yeah. Well, there, there's a finite. Yeah, it, it's. I mean, it. It. it, it there, there are dangers to that. Yes. Not, not, haven't played out a big problem yet. The, the number of generative test runs that we do. So when we introduce new invariants and uh, in violation logic, we, we run thousands and thousands and thousands of runs for, uh, for that test. To actually get through the pipeline, uh, we're going to do 100 uh, runs, uh, usually hundreds in the, uh, uh, of runs to make sure that it's OK. The key thing is that once you're actually introducing new code and new logic, we want to stress that. And we actually run, I don't know, like 5,000, 10,000 uh, times. We, we, not yet. Uh, we, we didn't really, I mean, there, there are concerns. And I guess the, the thing is, like, we, we don't have too many events per second for the same customer. Uh, the, the level of uh, number of events that we have, the, the, the frequency of these events are not huge, as in, for example, auto, auto trading or anything like that. So we, you know, essentially, we're going to have purchases that are going to happen, you know, once or twice, three times a day for the same customer. So that level of of, of possible inconsistencies will not be super significant for the business logic. You can just, you know, oh, okay, uh, I really only care about, you know, every second it should be correct. You know, every uh, that that that's the level of correctness that we we really care about uh, today. Uh, if we apply this to probably anything that has more events, more frequent events, then definitely something that we need to be concerned. Yeah, well, well for, for that, I think we, the way we handle that is just making sure that we have this immutable infrastructure that we're just spinning with config as code. We're spinning new services always with the same configuration. We're never going to be updating, reconfiguring our, our, our system. And it can essentially, through that, guarantee uh, that I'm going to have this uh, same version of all my services up and running with the same uh, you know, uh, configurations. And since we're deploying a lot, uh, usually the, the same instance won't really be there for more than, I don't know, one day or two. Uh, it's very hard to get in a weird state uh, like that. Usually when, when we actually have these random way in the past uh, numbers, it's actually customer service agents making uh, incorrect input for the post dates. And we figure that out with also looking at the data and saying, well, this broke some invariance because now we need to recalculate all these numbers or have all these entries that essentially rewrote history. Uh, well, that's strange. We can look at that. Yeah. 
It's uh, so we 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 get it's a it's a unique database per shard. Uh, it's it, and it's going to be available to essentially, yeah. You're going to have one database per sh sh uh, one service that's going to be accessing many databases, one per sharded customer. But each database is essentially just one transactor, one instance of that database. Yeah. So we do end up uh, because I'm 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 now getting some data from the database and modifying those balances. We have this optimistic lock uh, strategy. Um, with Datomic, uh, I can. Datomic is actually single threaded, but the way that's one of the ways that he's doing the acid part of uh, uh, the transaction. We so we essentially say these balances these this account that I'm consuming today at, at this point in time. He can't have changed, um, can't have a different balance from the point I started to the point I'm actually transacting. And when I'm actually checking that, I'm checking that within the transactor, uh, which is a single threaded process, and I can, can guarantee that you know if, if nothing changed, I can just con can transact. And if changed, I need to recalculate everything again and start from, from scratch. Another thing that helps is because our, we're, we're, we don't have any cross customer uh, entries, I can actually use Kafka partition keys to make sure that for the same customer, uh, the same thread is going to be picked up uh, because it's going to be partitioned by customer ID. So that's also another layer of uh, safety that we get uh, with uh, with that. Mm -hmm. So the out of order events, how, how do they happen? So they happen because other services are publishing messages. Uh, in, so one of the ways it happens is because we're plugged into other financial uh, systems of record. So for example, one of the ways that we recognize payments is that I'm going to communicate with a bank that's going to recognize the payments in, the, you know, in, our, in our system. And the, this bank is going to let us know, like, oh, this payment happened. And uh, since I, the, the actual payment didn't come from me, it depended, come, came from the outside world, and maybe he won't, just won't send me a batch of these payments for some bug on their system. Um, and on the purchase side, I deal with MasterCard. And that, they can also do the same kind of, kinds of things. Uh, <clears throat> so if all the events were originated actually in our system, then we could have stronger ordering guarantees. We can be more consistent with that. But we don't. And actually, what the terrible thing is that all payments in, in, in Brazil, the way you work, actually happen in the past. I always find out about them uh, one business day after they actually happen, and sometimes more, depending on how the guy actually pay, made the payment. So ordering is not, there's no way for me to guarantee ordering the way we operate today, unfortunately. Anything else? Thank you very much.